Good afternoon, students. Today is the introductory class to diabetes mellitus. This is going to facilitate our understanding of pharmacotherapy in the future classes. Today, I will be explaining the epidemiology, the definition, classification, etiopathogenesis, clinical features, and complications of diabetes. This is the symbol used to denote diabetes mellitus, just like we see a symbol for HIV in the form of a red ribbon. Epidemiology of diabetes mellitus. In 2013, an estimated 38.2 crore people globally had diabetes. Both men and women had equal rates. The mortality in 2012 and 2013 was 1.5 to 5.1 million people making it the eighth leading cause of death as you can see the darker the color more the incidence of diabetes so the economically better off countries have a higher incidence of diabetes if you look at the third world countries in south africa uh, in South America and Asia, the incidence is much less. Although the incidence of diabetes is increasing in the third world countries. Now definition of diabetes mellitus. Diabetes means siphoning off, means siphoning off water, excessive formation of urine. Mellitus means uh, a honey tasting urine, urine which tastes like honey. Diabetes mellitus is characterized by metabolic disturbances in uh, carbohydrate, protein and uh, lipid metabolism and it is characterized by hyperglycemia, glycosuria hyperlipidemia, negative nitrogen balance, sometimes ketonemia and an increased risk of complications due to vascular disease. Now, what is the reason for hyperglycemia in diabetes mellitus? It is because of the inability of the tissues to utilize the plasma glucose and why is it so? This is because of uh, inadequate secretion of insulin or due to insulin resistance insulin resistance means reduced sensitivity of the tissues to the actions of insulin glycosuria is seen in diabetes because there is a reduction in the ability of the kidneys to reabsorb glucose over a particular level. Now what happens is whatever glucose is filtered in the glomerulus is usually reabsorbed in the renal tubules. But since there is excessive glucose which is filtered in diabetes, the amount of glucose present in the filtrate is too much for the kidneys to reabsorb. And when the renal threshold for reabsorption is overwhelmed, glucose trickles into the urine to cause glycosuria. Now insulin interferes with lipolysis and since in diabetes mellitus there is a reduction in the action of insulin either because it is synthesized in less quantities or because of insulin resistance there is excessive breakdown of adipose tissue releasing triglycerides this is responsible for hypertriglyceridemia now insulin is basically an anabolic hormone in its absence there is going to be proteolysis breakdown of muscle proteins and uh, what happens is amino acids are released which get converted into glucose urea and ammonia in the liver now this urea is excreted giving rise to what is called as a negative nitrogen balance. Sometimes there is ketonemia and usually it is seen in type 1 diabetes because 
insulin lack is severe and whenever there is severe lack of insulin there is going to be excessive lipolysis releasing free fatty acids and free fatty acids are converted into ketones so ketones can be acetone acetoacetate and beta hydroxybutyric acid so the formation of ketone bodies is responsible for acidosis and when it becomes severe it can give rise to what is called as diabetic ketoacidotic coma now ketone bodies interfere with the utilization of glucose by the brain giving rise to some issues like altered consciousness and when it becomes very severe it can lead to diabetic coma now let us look at the reasons for uh, the vascular complications what is the pathogenesis for vascular complications in diabetes mellitus now vascular complications are basically because of the tissues being exposed to very high levels of plasma glucose for a long period of time this gives rise to what is called as non enzymatic glycosylation of tissue proteins and there is also accumulation of a reduced byproduct of glucose metabolism called as sorbitol so these two events are responsible for vascular pathological changes throughout the body giving rise to thickening of the capillary basement membrane there is increase in the vessel wall matrix as well as cellular proliferation these three changes in the blood vessels are responsible for there is a reduction in the lumen of the blood vessels there could be premature atherosclerosis and there is sclerosis of the glomerular capillaries these events are responsible for micro and macro vascular complications of uncontrolled diabetes mellitus so all the complications in diabetes mellitus is basically because of vascular pathology and that happens due to chronic exposure to high levels of plasma glucose now classification of diabetes mellitus basically there are two main types that is type 1 and type 2 type 1 may also be called as insulin dependent diabetes mellitus because the main treatment for type 1 diabetics is giving insulin and that is obvious because insulin secretion is very minimal and that is because of damage to the beta cells now another terminology for type 1 diabetes was juvenile onset diabetes mellitus which is no longer used because type 1 diabetes has also been seen in older individuals now the second type is type 2 diabetes mellitus which is also known as non insulin dependent diabetes mellitus because insulin levels are low normal or even high and uh, the reason for hyperglycemia being not just uh, a relative lack of insulin secretion but also because of insulin resistance now type 2 diabetes was also called as maturity onset diabetes mellitus because uh, the incidence is more in middle aged people after the age of 40 but now we don't use this term maturity onset diabetes mellitus because type 2 diabetes has also been seen in adolescent and pre adolescent individuals and it has been seen in children with the age of 5 years also now what is the reason for type 1 diabetes the etiology is due to destruction of beta cells in the islets of langerhans usually it is autoimmune in nature and uh, you can diagnose type 1 diabetes by uh, the uh, formation of islet cell antibodies in the blood sample now most of the type 1 cases are because of formation of islet cell antibodies but in a few cases you may not find this islet cell antibodies wherein you can call it as an idiopathic type of type 1 diabetes mellitus type 2 diabetes mellitus 
is because of a combination of a mild to moderate insulin lack plus one new terminology which is called as insulin resistance as i have told you insulin resistance is reduced sensitivity of the tissues to the action of insulin now insulin produces its action by interacting with what are called as insulin receptors which are almost present throughout the body they are membrane receptors and uh, the re reason for insulin resistance could be one down regulation of the insulin receptors or the transducer mechanisms would have become weak now we are saying insulin resistance is very important in the etiology of type 2 diabetes now what are the causes for insulin resistance number one it could be genetic that is a strong family history could be a cause for uh, type 2 diabetes in the offspring now uh, under environmental factors it could be obesity and lack of physical activity so there is a direct proportionality between body mass index and insulin resistance greater the body mass index more are the chances of insulin resistance and lack of physical activity has also been associated with insulin resistance apart from type 1 and type 2 diabetes there is type 3 and type 4 diabetes type 3 diabetes is because of genetic mutations pancreatic diseases endocrinopathies it could be glucocorticoid induced due to infections and some genetic syndromes and type 4 diabetes is because of pregnancy we call it as gestational diabetes mellitus now let us compare type 1 and type 2 diabetes now uh, the onset of type 1 diabetes is very sudden compared to the gradual onset in type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes is usually seen in children very rarely we find it in uh, uh, middle-aged individuals whereas type 2 diabetes is usually seen after the age of 40 but nowadays we have seen that in children also type 1 diabetics are usually thin or normal built whereas majority of type 2 diabetics are obese ketoacidosis is common in type 1 diabetes because the insulin secretion is very minimal there is a severe lack of insulin whereas it is rare in type 2 diabetes because insulin secretion can be normal it can be high and sometimes low also low means relatively low not very low now islet cell antibodies are usually found in type 1 diabetics but absent in type 2 diabetics and as we have seen endogenous insulin secretion is low or absent in type 1 diabetes whereas it can be normal increased or relatively decreased in type 2 diabetics genetic predisposition in type 2 diabetics is very high that means if the parents are having type 2 diabetes there's a very good chance for the offsprings to have type 2 diabetics genetic predisposition is relatively less in type 1 diabetics and majority of the diabetes mellitus patients are of type 2 that is 90 to 95 percent of all diabetics are type 2 diabetics so this uh, picture helps us to understand type 1 and type 2 diabetes better the healthy uh, individual you can see insulin secretion is normal and uh, the action on the insulin receptor is responsible for the transducer mechanisms which cause uh, uptake and utilization of glucose in type 1 diabetes the secretion of insulin is minimal so the uh, uptake of glucose and utilization of glucose is very less in type 2 diabetes you can find insulin secretion is normal but because of insulin resistance what has happened is the transducer mechanisms are not able to perform uh, their duties properly there is no uptake and utilization of glucose now uh, what are the symptoms in uh, diabetes mellitus so we saw there can be hyperglycemia glycosuria uh, dyslipidemia 
ketonemia, negative nitrogen balance, etc. But the patient usually presents with certain symptoms. For example, exhaustion. Easily the patient gets tired. This is one of the most important presenting symptoms of type 2 diabetes where the patient says the exercise tolerance of the patient has come down and uh, you can also see the patients can have symptoms of polyuria, polydipsia and uh, there could be some amount of drowsiness also and not to forget sometimes patients can present with polyphagia. Now let me tell you type 2 diabetes is predominantly asymptomatic. The patient may maximally complain of easy fatigability, reduced exercise tolerance but the symptoms of polyuria, polydipsia and polyphagia are classically seen in type 1 diabetics. So please remember type 2 diabetics may have an asymptomatic presentation except for easy fatigability and sometimes patients may present with a wound which is not healing. Now how do we diagnose diabetes mellitus? What are the laboratory parameters we use for diagnosing this? So one is HbA1c which is also called as glycosylated hemoglobin and in normal individuals it will be less than or equal to 5.6 percent in pre-diabetics it ranges from 5.7 to 6.4 percent and in diabetics it is greater than or equal to 6.5 percent fasting plasma glucose in normal individuals will be less than 100 milligram per deciliter in pre-diabetics it ranges from 100 to 125 milligram per deciliter and in diabetics it is greater than or equal to 126 milligram per deciliter and the third one is called as oral glucose tolerance test where after administering 75 grams of glucose dissolved in water two hours later a plasma glucose level if it is less than 140 milligram per deciliter then the patient is normal if the plasma glucose level ranges between 140 to 199 milligram per deciliter the person is a pre-diabetic if it is greater than or equal to 200 milligram per deciliter then you can call the patient a diabetic now let us look at the complications of diabetes mellitus it can be acute or chronic Acute complications can be in the form of diabetic ketoacidosis which is predominantly seen in type 1 diabetics and uh, there is what is called as hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma in type 2 diabetics. As I have told you in the previous slides, in type 1 diabetes there is a severe lack of insulin because of which there can be development of ketone bodies. but since in type 2 diabetics insulin levels can be normal or even high the chances of ketone body formation is relatively less because very rarely we do find insulin levels lesser in type 2 diabetics chronic complications of diabetes mellitus can be microvascular or macrovascular as i have already explained the vascular pathological changes take place throughout the body giving rise to complications so what does happen is the vascular uh, complications will interfere with the flow of blood because of a reduction in the lumen of the blood vessels and uh, this can be critical to the various organs of the body microvascular complications of diabetes can be diabetic nephropathy diabetic retinopathy and diabetic neuropathy so as the name suggests is the small blood vessels which are affected that is why microvascular complications now macrovascular complications obviously the larger blood vessels are involved they are affected for example the cerebral artery the coronary artery and the other uh, major arteries so cerebrovascular events like TIAs, transient ischemic attacks and strokes, coronary artery diseases like uh, 
angina pectoris, myocardial infarction and peripheral vascular diseases which can lead to foot ulcers and gangrene. So diabetic nephropathy especially due to type 2 diabetes has been found to cause around 35 to 50 percent of end stage renal disease that means the only option in end stage renal disease is either renal transplantation or lifelong di dialysis this is according to the data system from uh, united states so the diabetic kidney glomerulus it shows podocyte loss mesangial expansion expansion of the mesangial matrix there is thickening of the glomerular basement membrane and some pathological changes in the capillary loop so this is one of the microvascular complications of diabetes mellitus another microvascular complication diabetic neuropathy so the blood vessels which are supplying the nerves are affected uh, giving rise to uh, some ischemic changes in the nerves so there can be nerve damage so diabetic neuropathy can present as a tingling sensation paresthesias or even loss of sensation now nerve damage and also the vascular abnormalities can give rise to foot ulcers and gangrene diabetic foot ulcers can be seen in 4 to 10 percent of patients with diabetes according to a study in 2012. Diabetic foot gangrene may develop in 5 out of every thousand people with diabetes and it needs an amputation. Another microvascular complication, diabetic retinopathy, is one of the leading causes of blindness and uh, the blood vessels supplying the retina are affected. There is abnormality in these blood vessels, there is more tortuosity, there is aneurysms, there can be hemorrhages and as you can see there are some cotton wool spots also. These are the pathological changes. What does happen is there can be uh, neovascularization new blood vessels may be formed these new blood vessels are very fragile they can break open and give rise to hemorrhages these hemorrhages can give rise to macular edema and that can be a cause for vision disturbances and for diabetic uh, retinopathy we do a fundoscopic examination using midriatics so one of the uses of midriatics is fundoscopic examination to uh, find out the status of the retinal blood vessels in patients of hypertension and diabetes macrovascular complications of diabetes can be coronary artery disease which can manifest as angina pectoris and myocardial infarction cerebrovascular strokes and transient ischemic attacks can also be because of the macrovascular complications of diabetes affecting the cerebral artery so thank you very much so what i have tried to do in this presentation is tell you all aspects of diabetes mellitus which will help us to understand the pharmacotherapy of diabetes mellitus better thank you very much happy reading any doubts, you are most welcome to ask.